you very much and welcome to the Voice of America from your Mars simulation. Um, if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hello Roseanne. My name is Melissa Battler and I am the commander of the expedition. I'm a geologist by training, so I'm also doing some geology on the crew and at home I'm working on my master's in planetary geology. Hi Roseanne, my name is Matt, Matt Bamsey. I'm the executive officer and safety officer here. I'm currently doing a PhD uh, at the University of Guelph in Canada focusing on uh, biological life support systems and uh, I'm here as an engineer doing a water study. Now, before the interview, um, Melissa, you said you hadn't been too many places that weren't Mars related. How did you get involved in all this? Ugh, that's going back now. I guess it was about four years ago that I first got involved with doing research at the Mars Does It Research Station through Mars Society of Canada. Um, this is also through some of my work during my undergrad at the um, Waterloo Space Society at the University of Waterloo and also at the York said Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. So it's been about five years in total that I've been involved with this stuff. I first met Matt four years ago on an expedition we were on together called Expedition One and just got really interested in this sort of work so we've been uh, advancing it further and further and uh, now we're here doing a four-month simulation. Well tell me a little bit about this mission and what the purpose is. There's been three, there have been three other Mars related um, simulated missions as I understand it through the Mars Society. Uh, what's different about this one? Well, uh, there have been several different types of simulations before, but the longest duration previous to this one was only one month. So the biggest difference is that we're here for four months this time, simulating every aspect we possibly can of a human mission to Mars. Um, everything from working conditions to the field work that we do outside to just living conditions and how we live and spend our spare time as well. So the four months um, is actually quite a big change over one month. They at first were thinking we could just sort of scale up and plan things the same as for a one month mission, but it's completely different when you're living here for four months. So um, it's just we're very we're very isolated as well up here in the Arctic. At the other research stations you're a little bit closer to people, but here we're so far away from home and so far away from help if something were to go wrong that it pretty much feels like we're on Mars. And we've had to deal with some pretty tough weather up here too over the four months. The past expeditions have been the one month but usually in uh, through July and us we arrived uh, end of April or early May so we've had to deal with some uh, relatively cold and extreme weather just as you would on Mars. So why did you choose the North Arctic? Describe the location and how it's Mars like. Well, uh, the Mars Arctic Research Station is located just on the edge of Houghton Crater. And Houghton Crater is an impact crater very similar to many craters that you see on the surface of Mars. So right there, it's a really good analog in terms of the geology and a lot of the science. And the latitude, the fact that we're this far north, means that we have similar landforms just related to the temperatures, such as permafrost, which you would find on Mars also, we suspect. So the, that means that the work that we can do up here is actually, it doesn't just feel like we're on Mars, but we're studying extreme environments that you expect that you might find on Mars. So therefore, a lot of our scientific findings might be carried over to planning for a human Mars mission in terms of the science as well. Did I miss anything? We're, we're going to go into a little bit about what, what that science is in, in just a moment. Um, could you describe those surroundings in your habitat, uh, where, where you're living? Sure, we're in, uh, as you mentioned previously, a tuna can type structure. It's a cylinder of about 8 meters in diameter. Um, the main reason why we're living in such an arrangement is that this would be a, a potential uh, habitat that you could send to the moon or Mars in terms of its volume and even layout inside. So we're in a two-story structure. Um, there's seven of us here, so quite confined quarters. And again, as Melissa mentioned, in terms of the environment here on Devon Island, it is a polar desert. So when we look outside the porthole windows, we are seeing a very barren landscape, very little plant life whatsoever, unless you really bend down and look at it. So in terms of the feeling of being on Mars, as, as Melissa said, uh, it really drives that home and really makes you feel like you're on Mars. Well, how do you take care of your basic needs like food and water and power and plumbing? I think this is another question for Matt as one of our engineers. Take it away, Matt. Sure. Um, we have a few people devoted. To, we have three engineers here on site, so most of us, a, a great deal of our time is devoted to just taking care of the upkeep of the habitat. So one, one thing is fuel and uh, power. So we have a generator running more or less 24-7 to provide the power that we need for communications back home. 
Uh, and one other interesting thing is our water. The first few months that we were here, we were getting our water from snow. So we had to go through the whole process of collecting snow, melting it, making sure the quality was up to par, uh, and then you know using it just as you would on a on a moon or Mars station. So we're trying to conserve conserve our water as much as possible, and we're monitoring that. Uh, drinking water, hygiene water, etc., to get an idea how much a, a crew would use in the future. All right, what about your food? I mean, did you pack it all in? We tried to. We, well, we're a little bit limited in terms of storage space here, so we are using only the type of food that you would be able to eat on a long duration mission. So only shelf storable food, unfortunately no fresh vegetables, other than what we're able to grow here ourselves. We do grow some lettuce and some sprouts, and we've been pretty happy with the frequency that we've been able to eat vegetables a couple times a week, which is more than we expected. Um, but other than that, we have had to have, uh, we've had a few flights to bring a little bit more food to us. We plan to have one flight each month, just in case we ran into emergencies where we needed more supplies. And again, to compensate for the lack of sufficient storage space, but on a real Mars mission, you would have more storage space. And therefore, you wouldn't have to worry about that. And we're really fortunate to have one crew member named Kim, Kim Binstead from University of Hawaii, and she's a phenomenal cook, uh, cooking up some amazing things with some uh, ingredients that you would typically maybe not use in a regular kitchen, such as textured vegetable protein. So we've had some really great meals here. Yeah. So you haven't suffered that much. No. <laughs> whatever, whatever food you're missing. Um, in, in the simulation, is it who acts as, as master control, uh, and how is it coordinated? I mean, uh, right. on a mission, on a typical a, a space mission, you would think that there would be a an Earth link, a constant Earth link. Is is that the way in which your your mission is coordinated, or are you left out there to uh, in the cold? <laughs> It's a little bit of both. Now we have we do have mission support, and we report to them every day. We send them reports on our science and on our EVAs. Those are extravehicular activities, or when we go and do field work. Also, an engineering report, and a journalist report, and a commander's check-in and photos. <laughs> Lots of reports. Just to let them know what we're up to every day, and then they use those reports to update the website. But. Unlike some of the missions that are run at the Mars Desert Research Station, where mission support plays a very large role in dictating what happens day to day, here we are far enough away that we're pretty much on our own to make the day-to-day -day decisions. So mission support is there in case, in case we need help, in case we need questions answered that we don't have the resources to answer here ourselves. But other than that, um, we, we handle the major decisions. Um, the ones that are more relevant to where we are right now. We also have a remote engineering team and a remote science team and they help us with those questions.